there was an idea called the Avengers Initiative. The idea was to bring together a group of remarkable people, see if they could work together when we needed them to, to fight the battles that we never could. My first exposure to Marvel Comics was in the early 90s. That introduction took place because of one poster. The Marvel Universe poster from 1988 hung on the bedroom walls of thousands of kids around the world. It was large enough to fit all of the characters up to that point onto one giant canvas. It's like the Where's Waldo of Marvel Comics. I would go over all the time to my friend John's house who had it on his wall. Every time I was there, I would try to spot someone new on the poster. And then I would quiz John about the character, asking him all kinds of questions. He knew all of them, which is impressive when I think back on it today. Back then, that was a time before the internet. People like John spent their time and money reading most of the comics that each character was from. I, on the other hand, could only name a few. Vision! Iron Man! Most kids knew about the Avengers from playing the arcade game Avengers Assemble! And everyone knew about the X-Men because of the TV show. But John showed me that there were so many more worth checking out. John eventually moved away, but just before he left, he gave me his poster. It wasn't until a few years ago that I found it hidden in the corner of my garage. I opened it up and started seeing characters that I never noticed before. For the past 10 years, we've been living in a time where Marvel Studios has brought so many of these characters to life. They've become fully realized on film, rendered in a way that's believable. So unraveling the poster again, after all these years, was like opening up a time capsule. Just about every major character appearing in the Marvel films today is on this poster. Now, in 2018, Avengers Infinity War becomes like the cinematic comparison of this poster, taking more superheroes than ever before to adapt one of the most iconic stories in comic book history. 76 characters, to be exact. And each of them plays an important part in telling that story becoming the biggest crossover in film history. But Infinity War is more than just characters. Marvel Studios has done something that's never been done before, telling an interconnected story over 10 years, pulling iconic characters from across the company's almost 80-year history. And that build-up ends with a big payoff. Infinity War is the culmination of 18 films, telling stories through just about every genre, breaking all kinds of records, and presenting it in a format that's never been achieved before for a feature-length film. It was all shot completely in IMAX. But before we dive into the film, let's look at some of the history first. When you think of Marvel superheroes, you probably think of two teams, the X-Men and the Avengers. When it comes to adapting them for film, the X-Men came first in 2000, eight years before Marvel started laying the groundwork for the Avengers with Iron Man in 2008. The Hulk from 2003 doesn't count, but in the comics, both the Avengers and the X-Men were introduced in the same year and in the same month. September of 1963 was a big year for comics. In the Avengers' first issue, the team was just Iron Man, Thor, Ant-Man, and the Hulk, who took on Loki in their first battle, which is pretty much what we saw in 2012 in the Avengers' first film. I am a god, you dull creature, and I will not be bullied by that. In the comics, Captain America didn't join the Avengers until 1964, even though he's been around since 1941, fighting Nazis and punching Hitler in the face. The Avengers weren't the original super team. That title goes to the Justice Society of America in 1940. They eventually became the Justice League. Throughout the 20th century, members of the Avengers appeared in comics, TV shows, and in several feature films. 
As for live action, Captain America goes back the furthest, donning the stars and stripes since the 40s. Stop this. There are two bullets left. Yes, I'll hit one presently. He made a return in the 80s with his own film, as well as Spider-Man, Hulk, and Thor all showing up on TV. Even Iron Man made it into live action in 1978. The Marvel Superheroes TV show in 1966 starred the four main Avengers, each getting their own segments. More animated heroes from Marvel got their own TV shows through each decade, leading up to the turn of the century, starting with Spider-Man in the 60s, the Fantastic Four in the 70s, the Hulk in the 80s, and the X-Men, Iron Man, and Silver Surfer in the 90s. The tail end of all of that is where I started watching. The X-Men and Spider-Man animated series educated most of us who didn't grow up reading the comics. Watching the TV show made us want to start reading. I summon forth the shielding powers of the Vishanti! Impressive! Who are you anyway? I am Doctor Strange, master of the mystic arts. As a companion to the comics, kids would also collect the trading cards. Not just any cards, but a specific run. Marvel Universe Trading Cards Series 3 was the run to collect. Listed out on the back were their power ratings. This was huge, because it gave you something you never had before, perspective. When you started to collect the cards, you could quickly compare your favorite characters, ranking them by powers and abilities. But trading cards could only hold so much information. That's where the Marvel Official Handbook came in. Through several issues, it gave a detailed rundown of each character, complete with the write-up and illustrations of all their costumes, weapons, vehicles, secret hideouts, you name it. Throughout the years, I would pick up new issues as characters got adapted for the big screen. I loved comparing the original comic designs with how they appeared in the films. There's even an Instagram account for doing just that called Accurate MCU. Check them out. All of this plays part in the excitement of being a fan. Handbooks and trading cards are fun because it gives us the ability to see all the characters together. It's the appeal of a good video game. Or a box of action figures. As a kid, when you dumped out your collection, you could pick out a set of characters to fight each other, regardless of which franchise they were from. Growing up, we did this all the time. And what we were creating is called a crossover. Crossovers are nothing new. The concept of a shared fictional universe begins in the same place fiction did, with mythology. Authors were casting existing gods and heroes into blockbuster epics. If you think the Avengers were stacked, just look at the Argonauts. You got Theseus, Orpheus, and Hercules all on the same boat. During the 19th century, authors like Jules Verne began to use reoccurring characters creating a shared universe within their own books. Some even took it further, letting other creators share their characters like H.P. Lovecraft. He allowed his friends to use his Cthulhu monster in their stories, for free. It wasn't profitable for him, but it did keep his legacy alive. When it comes to comic books, Marvel was the company to bring the first crossover in 1940 where Namor and the Human Torch faced off in battle. Marvel gave you the sense that their stories across all their books were happening at the same time, in the same world. Spider-Man tries to pay the bills by auditioning for the Fantastic Four. The Thing's date gets ruined by soldiers who mistaken him for the Hulk. And Thor and the X-Men are bumping elbows and sharing appetizers at Reed and Sue's wedding. Shared cinematic universes began in 1943. We all know the famous ones like King Kong vs. Godzilla, Wreck-It Ralph, or the Lego Movie, but we can forget about all the others like Roger Rabbit and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Dr. Jekyll, at your service. 
The League is set. The first crossover film was Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. The Universal Monster series was the first to have a shared cinematic universe, and eventually were included as characters in the Marvel Universe. When you take a look through the handbook, they're all there. Especially Dracula, who had his own comic run and an animated feature film. And if it weren't for Marvel Comics including Dracula, we would never have Blade. His first appearance was in The Tomb of Dracula, number 10. Now, Marvel marries that with something up until recently has only been associated with TV. Episodic storytelling. Here's where the Avengers get a new leader. No, stop. Cap, Hawkeye. Look, it's a court order. We've been ordered to disband the Avengers. Television has been giving us programming since the 40s, but Netflix took it to the next level. We binge watched entire seasons in just a few days. But when it comes to going out to the movies, things have been pretty traditional for over a century. The viewer is not required or expected to tune back in for a part two or a season finale. Most of the time, the experience of seeing a film is contained, giving us a complete story. That is, until now. We've seen franchises use episodic filmmaking before, like James Bond, which now has up to 25 films. But each installment doesn't require the viewer to see the other films. They're episodic, just not connected. Harry Potter, on the other hand, is a franchise that was very connected. It told a story over 10 years, as we all watched the characters, as well as the actors, grow over time. But probably the most well-known example of episodic storytelling in film would be Star Wars. At the start of each film, we're given an update, an idea that was borrowed from Flash Gordon. Now, Marvel has taken interconnected storytelling to new heights, culminating in one giant season finale. It's TV for the cinema. Throughout these 10 years, we saw the Avengers form together, which, let's be honest, on paper, this all sounds ridiculous. <laughs> There's a robot man, a magician, a witch, a talking raccoon, an Ant-Man, and a Spider-Man. There's even a member of the team that can shapeshift, just like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. These things fit well for an episode of Looney Tunes, but all of this shouldn't work for film. But it does. The Marvel Cinematic Universe started in 2008 with Iron Man. Jarvis, you there? At your service, sir. That end credit scene was important because it showed us Nick Fury, the one who would end up assembling the team. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. His look was a redesign, and we can thank a specific series in the comics for that. The Ultimates used the likeness of Samuel L. Jackson, and fans loved it. They loved it so much that Marvel ended up casting Jackson for the role. The road to Infinity War was laid out into three phases. The main four each got their own film, which all came together in the Avengers to finish out Phase 1. Thor took us into outer space, showing us that there was much more to the MCU than just Earth. Ant-Man introduces us to the Quantum Realm, an alternate dimension only accessible by going subatomic. Go sub Doctor Strange takes us into the multiverse. Open your eyes. A collection of parallel dimensions existing in one giant alternate universe. Mind and matter meet. Teach me. Now all of these films come together in the biggest shared cinematic universe to date. Infinity War will be the 19th film in the franchise. What really sets the MCU apart is not just the number of films, but also the wide range of genres, and all of them combined together to finish one big story. 
Infinity War is like the season finale to a TV show. A finale that's based on a now famous book. The Infinity Gauntlet was a six issue limited series from 1991. This is what got me into reading Marvel Comics. The copy I own is a hardcover, which I recently just found out is now pretty rare. Last weekend, I was able to meet the artist that illustrated the book, George Perez. I got him to sign my copy. It's kind of like the Marvel Universe poster. Everyone's in it, and it has Marvel's biggest villain, Thanos, as the main protagonist. He wears a golden gauntlet on his hand, which holds the power to rule the entire universe. There are six gems that weaponize it, each with a very specific power. I recently found the official Marvel fan magazine from 1990 that teased all the readers that Infinity Gauntlet was coming. It's fun to look at now because back then, they had no idea how important it would become. So let's talk about the film. Avengers Infinity War had the biggest opening weekend of all time. It didn't just break the mold, it broke the bank. It was also the largest opening in China and became the fastest film to earn a billion dollars. Without a doubt, film history classes will be talking about Infinity War for years. But it won't just be studied because it broke records, it will be analyzed for how it changed the way we see movies. No longer is episodic storytelling only told on TV. We've been viewers of this story now for 10 years. The MCU has redefined how to create a shared universe, and over a decade, the previous 18 films established a story that has a big payoff. It's been teased for almost a decade, and it delivers. But to the surprise of most fans, it wasn't an adaptation of the Infinity Gauntlet. It's really a retelling of the Thanos quest, the book that comes just before Gauntlet. I have a copy of my own, but turns out it's out of print. I wanted to see how rare it was, so I made a few calls. Local comic stores and several of my friends. No one had a copy. But how can that be? This is basically the book they adapted for the new film. They picked out a few things they liked from the Infinity Gauntlet and swapped out characters to fit the current roster. A comic run that's confusing many people and has nothing to do with the film is the series that shares the same name. Infinity War is a sequel to the Infinity Gauntlet and it's not very good. So don't let that confuse you. Marvel Studios has been teasing us with the mention of the stones, planting seeds throughout the films for over 10 years. We've also been teased with Thanos himself. We got a few sneak peeks through post credit scenes, and then Guardians gave us our first good look. And of course, that last tease at the end of Age of Ultron, where he puts on the gauntlet. I'll do it myself. The first time I saw him was in a video game. In the end battle of the arcade game Marvel Super Heroes was a scene ripped straight from the pages of the Infinity Gauntlet. When you look him up in the official handbook, he's classified as something known as an Eternal. Eternals are an advanced race of beings created about a million years ago through genetic experiments conducted by a group called the Celestials. These are like space gods and stand thousands of feet tall. And even bigger than the Eternals is Eternity, who is literally the embodiment of all life in the universe. His equal is Death, and she's the one who Thanos is in love with. In Marvel Comics, Death is female. She gives him the task of wiping out half of all existence in the universe in order to restore balance. She was his motivation but her character was dropped from Infinity War completely. Instead, they made the quest to end overpopulation a conviction that only Thanos had, which is very similar to an old Star Trek episode called Conscience of the King from 1966. Governor Kodos from an Earth colony commits genocide on his own people in order to solve world hunger. Kodos began to separate the colonists. Some would live, be rationed whatever food was left. The remainder would be immediately put to death. 
Some had to die that others might live. Kodos sounds a lot like Thanos. The original plan was Infinity War would be broken up into two parts, very similar to what Harry Potter, Twilight, and The Hunger Games did with their final films. But that release strategy started to become predictable and not very good for repeat viewings. Even though it ended up being a part one, in the end, I don't think it really hurt the film at all. Many are calling it the Star Wars for a new generation, and Thanos is the new Darth Vader which would make this like the Empire Strikes Back of the franchise. This video wasn't a film review since we've all seen the movie by now and because Infinity War really is just part one of a two-part story. So I'll wait until next year to give it my grade, but I wanted to make this video to discuss just how much Infinity War has changed the way we see movies. But what do you think? Is this the future of cinema? Leave your comments down below, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. When Captain America throws his mighty shield, all those who chose to oppose this shield must yield. If he's led to a fight and a duel is due, then the red and the white and the blue will come through when Captain America throws his mighty shield.